Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. This is our hearty bunch that got out here at a 12 degree below wind chill. Now, if you're not warm enough here in the sanctuary, it's because you're so spread out, so you can scoot together. If you're cold, you can scoot together. I know there are only so many ends, and everybody's got to have an end, but, you know, we can scoot together if we need to. Let's take just a moment to greet one another in the name of Christ. As you make your way back to your seats, as you make your way back to your seats, now that you have figured out who has warm hands and who has cold hands this morning, I want to start our announcement time this morning with a mission moment from Susan Hobecker. Good morning. I've been asked to talk about Ned Hobecker's scholarship at uh, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Evanston, uh, in Illinois. I want to thank the church, my family and I want to thank the church for the memorial that you have given to the church, but also to the seminary, which is going to help many students in the future. Um, this year, it, this is the first time that the money has been given to someone to build up enough money. And so it is given to Joanne Lagman, and I'm sure she is going to really appreciate this um, in the future. Many college students come out of, with a high, you know, high rate of tuition to pay back. And then they go into seminary, and seminary costs $22,000 a year. So they have carried that burden over the years. Um, so this scholarship is going to help. And I have a couple of thank yous from previous scholarship winners. Thank you for helping me make this career change late in life to follow my passion to spread the good news of a loving God. And then another person wrote, the gift of scholarship money not only makes my study possible, but it is a constant reminder that there are people outside of my family fully supporting my education. So this is going to help people in the future and thank you very much for that scholarship money. I've also been asked to talk about Ned's missionary uh, service in Japan. Ned was there three years, and I was there one year. We taught English in Kobe, Japan. That has a population of one and a half million people. And it's an oceanfront uh, on the ocean front for 20 miles to Osaka with population all along the way for seven and a half million people. Ned taught English at Palmore Institute. It was a night school supported by the Southern Methodist Conference in the United States. Uh, this night school taught English and business. So the students would come after work and go to this night school to learn English and business. They would ride the train for those many miles to get to the school. Ned would have 30 to 40 students in a class. On Wednesday nights, he had a Bible study, tea, and conversation in his apartment. He gave chapel talks over a week, and he chaperoned the choir 
and sponsored the choir at the weekly Bible uh, services. My teaching was at three different places. I taught at Ashia College two days a week. I had between 30 and 50 students in a class, and I taught at Kame High School, which was also a Methodist school uh, supported by the L Southern Methodist Conference. I lived with two American teachers in a house that was part of the junior high school. My school, that a high school that I taught, was a girls' school, and it was a block away. I gave chapel talks to the girls. I would look out in the auditorium, and I would see 600 young girls in navy blue uniforms, 600 black-haired girls, and 600 pairs of eyes. And I would speak God's love and stories through an interpreter. You might be interested in this because it's a little different than here in the States. I would have 60 students in a classroom. The class would enter the class, the classroom. I would enter. They would rise and bow and say, good morning, Lawson Sensei. And then the bell would ring at the close of the class. They would stand and bow and say, thank you very much, Lawson Sensei and then they would go off to another classroom. I also taught two nights a week at the, in the education department at the YMCA. And that was a small class from uh, ages 16 to 60. And I also directed the youth choir at the Kobe Union Church. This was uh, a church in English for missionary families, for uh, the corporate business people in that area. And I, these children, the youth in the choir, uh, were high school students from the International Canadian Academy. I learned a lot that one year in Japan, but what I learned from that year, and also when Ned and I did a pulpit exchange, in Barnstable, England, that no matter what country people are from, no matter ethnicity of people, no matter the color, black, white, yellow, black, red, we all have joys, we all have sorrows, we all have health problems and other problems that come up. The only thing that's different is our language. I would like to close with this Example, Helen Hillhouse, another missionary, and I were invited to go to one of my students and Ned's students' homes in Hiroshima. We, of course, went, and we, the, the couple we were to stay with, the uncle of my student, was a music teacher. And he taught a piano lesson while I was there. And we were looking at the pictures on the wall. Now, the pictures there are slanted. As you're sitting down, you can see the family pictures slanted down. And there was a particular picture that was just wonderful of a beautiful young lady. And at the close of the piano lesson, we said, both Helen and I said, what a beautiful young lady that is. Who is she? And there was silence. And we knew we'd touched on something sad. And my cousin, the cousin of the girl, my student, said, that's my cousin and my uncle's daughter. They lived outside the city of Hiroshima. Now, Hiroshima is surrounded by mountains. And they lived outside the mountains, and they, she went to school by train every morning within the city of Hiroshima and when the atomic bomb was dropped and she was killed. Later that evening, they entertained us with a wonderful sukiyaki meal, 
in their well landscaped, beautifully landscaped garden with a nephew playing strolling music around us as we ate. I will never forget that evening. There was forgiveness there. There was forgiveness. God sent his son to teach us how to live. God sent his son Jesus to teach us how to love. And God sent his son to teach us how to forgive. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. In February, we will be taking up our mission offering, and it will go toward the uh, Ned Halbaker Scholarship at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. And, you know, if you gasped at $22,000 a year, just remember that's the tuition. That's not the books. It's not the gas to get there. Uh, yeah, it's not cheap couple of reminders. We are still doing our just one. We ask you to add an extra dollar. If you want to do it the fun way, go to your bank and ask them for a roll of the gold dollars. They'll look at you funny, but they have them. They have James Garfield on them this year. So either add your paper or your coin dollars. That'll help us continue to increase our budget each year couple of meeting announcements. There will be no First Friends meeting this week, and there will be a trustees meeting Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Remember, the office is closed tomorrow for the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. We have a very special event coming up on Thursday. Uh, we will be hosting the book launch for Chaddock School. This is the second book that they have sponsored. You can read more about it in your bulletin. That will be Thursday at 6.30, and we invite you to come. Chaddock is one of our United Methodist uh, ministries here in this conference over in Quincy, and so we invite you to come and support them in this new endeavor with their book launch. Most importantly, next Sunday is Youth Sunday. Um, so let's pack the pews, folks. Let's see how many we can get here. Um, look around you. If there is space in the pew in which you are sitting, then you can invite that many people to come with you, okay? And believe it or not, the front pews aren't broken. <laughs> so we can even pack those pews. So let's come in and support our youth next Sunday. For John Wesley, one of the most important questions that he could ask someone was, how is it with your soul? He made that a part of the plan for every Methodist meeting, every Methodist gathering. How is it with your soul? So today, let's reflect on that question from two aspects. How is it with your soul? How is it with our soul as a congregation?
Would you please stand as able for our call to worship? We gather in this beautiful place to worship. We gather with other servants of Christ in this place of service. We gather as people of Christ, seeking to be people of vision. Our opening hymn has been very intentionally chosen. The lyrics are by Charles Wesley. And this is the hymn that opens every annual conference and has for over 200 years here in the United States. The question, and are we yet alive, was both physical and spiritual because these pastors would only see each other once a year and many would die as they rode the circuits. But it's also equally appropriate for us as we gather each week, sometimes seeing each other only on Sundays, but giving thanks to God that we are able to gather. Number one, it's number 884. This is the statement of faith of the Korean Methodist Church. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example and redeemer, the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, 
and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord, for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. And now let us join in our hymn number 500 as we begin our time. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, choir. for our prayer time by singing Spirit of God descend upon my heart.
join in our unison prayer? Renew your church, Lord, your people in this land. Save us from cheap words and self-deception in your service. In the power of your spirit, transform us and shape us by your cross. Amen. Let us be in a time of silent prayer. Spirit of God, descend upon our hearts. Fill us with your gracious spirit and make us willing witnesses to your love and grace. Open our hearts to receive your message and open our lips to share that message with all we may meet this week. Show us that even one voice telling of your love can make a difference in this world. Be with all those who are in need this day, those who need your healing presence, those who need your comfort, those who need to know that life has a purpose. We are the living witnesses to the transforming power of your love. May others see in us the hope that comes from a life lived in your love. Keep us ever aware of those around the world whose needs are great, those living in poverty, those living with daily hunger, those living in the midst of war and conflict. Open our eyes to the many ways that we can help others. Open our hearts to serve you by serving them. Be with our first responders and our military men and women around the world who serve in places of peace and places of war. Keep them in your care and bring comfort to their families until once again they will be reunited. We offer these and all our prayers in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
from the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew records Jesus' last words to the disciples in this way. Now the eleven went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And then in Acts, as Luke records some of the history of the early church, awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, as we stand before your word, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. About this time of year, every year, the President of the United States fulfills a constitutional obligation by presenting the State of the Union Address. Now, in my opinion, it is usually a list of what the President wants to take credit for in the previous year, unless, of course, it is an election year. And then it's just a nationally televised campaign speech. The purpose of the speech, as conceived in the minds of the Founding Fathers, was to keep Congress and the American people apprised of what is happening in the nation, especially in an era when communication was very slow. Well, I'd like to make an official announcement that I am the only one in the country that is not running for president this year. And so I am not under a constitutional requirement to make a report. But in the United Methodist Church, January is the time of year that we make a report, about a six-page report, actually, on the previous year. So, since I have to make the report anyway, it's a good time to report to you to let you know what the state of the church is, if you will. Now, we could start with the state of the denomination. And the best we might say is, it's complicated. We know there are going to be changes in the last 12 months. There have been changes in the last 30 days. But while we don't know what those changes will be, I do know one thing for certain. God is still God. God is still with us. God will continue to be with us, regardless of what, ha what happens. So instead of worrying about the denomination right now, let's focus on our congregation, who we are. For those of you who are statistically minded, let me give you some general statistics. 
Our average attendance for 2019 was down just slightly from 2018. Our number of giving units for 2020 is up over 2019. Our overall expenses for 2019 were approximately $19,000 below what we budgeted. Our 2019 income was about $13,000 over what we budgeted. While we still had an expected shortfall, the margin was much, much less than we had budgeted for. All that is good. Those show healthy signs from the congregation. But, of course, we are not a conglomeration of statistics, of attendance and finance. So let me tell you what I see. Now, my eyes on this congregation are fairly new, which can be an advantage or a disadvantage. But just remember, this is what I see after six and a half months. First, let's talk about the leadership. And by leadership, I mean all of those who are in volunteer positions in the church in some way, shape, or form. We currently have somewhere over 150 people involved in volunteer leadership positions here in the church. From office volunteers, to committee members, to ushers, to musicians, and more. And these leaders are faithful to the task at hand. They are committed to serve Christ by serving others through the church. I was very pleasantly surprised last fall as the nominations committee got to work looking for members for the different committees. Now, the committee was very serious about looking for people to put in the right places of service as opposed to putting a warm body in a chair. And as they made calls to ask people to serve, there were very, very few refusals. Now, you may find this hard to believe, but I have been in churches where, as we called people to serve, the refusal rate was somewhere between 50 and 75 percent. Our refusal rate was under 10 percent of the people that we called. And all of those who refused had a reason, not just, oh, I don't feel like it. They had a reason that they couldn't serve on that particular committee in this particular time. That reflects a congregation who is willing to step up and do more than just come to worship and write a check. You are a congregation of willing servants. Second, let's talk about the service of the church. And by service, I mean the way that we care for those who are traditionally outside the walls of the church. And as I reflect on that, all I can say is, wow. We hosted the MAX program, the assistance program, five days a week for years, until just last month, they moved over to the nor new Northeast Community Center facility. We feed 250 or more people every month at dinner downtown, all with volunteers. We have a scarf and mitten tree. We have the Christmas shop. We have trash and treasure. We host both Boy Scout and Girl Scout troops here in the building. We have a kids club for the children on Saturdays. We collect for the food pantry. We collect for goodie bags for our college students. And all that is just the tip of the iceberg. 
there are so many other quiet things that are happening that I don't even know about yet. Wow. You are truly acting as the body of Christ to the world. As a congregation, we are always finding new ways to serve the community. Our Bell Tower concert series that kicked off last fall will be continuing in 2020, inviting people to come to this beautiful place to hear wonderful music. Through our Kids Club, a grant has allowed us to start a small mentoring program to train people on basic workplace computer skills. And those are just two of the new opportunities that came up in 2020, or in 2019, excuse me. I cannot wait to see what is out there for 2020 that we don't even know about yet. Overall, I think if I were grading this congregation as the people of Christ, I would give you an A minus. Now, why an A minus instead of an A? Okay, those of you who, like me, obsessed over grades, there's a huge difference between an A minus and an A, okay? But an A minus because I think there's always room for improvement. Always. I think one of the things we can do better is to be more intentional about personal, one-on-one -on -one invitations to come and be part of the activities here at the church, the worship here at the church. Statistics tell us that on average, less than 40% of the population in this area attends worship regularly. And by regularly, that means twice a month. If we truly believe that we have something great in Jesus Christ, something life-transforming, and that we want others to have this, we should not be hesitant about inviting others to join us. Now you may wonder why in the world is she talking about all this? Did she just not have time to put together a sermon so pulled all the statistics together and just threw them, threw them together and, and made it work? No. I think it's really important to know where we are. Now I know I've talked a lot about looking through the windshield and not the rear view mirror. And sometimes looking back at the past year feels like looking in the rearview mirror. But there is an advantage to doing that occasionally. You see, we have a mission as the church to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That is the official mission of the United Methodist Church. And to fulfill that mission, we have to know where we are and where we're going to go. And then we have to determine how to get there. And that leads into our vision statement. It was adopted last fall by the church council, and we are putting it on just about everything we can think of. Look at the front of your bulletin. See the little box down at the bottom? where it says growing in relationship with Christ through building and nurturing relationships with others. That's our vision statement. That's what we envision the church to be doing in this time and in this place. All the work that we do as a staff, as committees, and in worship should be leading us in that direction. This is how we are taking our mission to make disciples forward. As your pastor, 
part of my job is to think about and pray about where God is leading us and how God is leading us. My reflections today are kind of what I have discerned in my own prayer time with God. And of course, I will be continuing to pray and to listen to God for guidance throughout the year. But we need to add one more thing to our list of things to do. We do it well, but we always can do it better. It's the most important thing that we can do as a congregation. We must be a praying congregation. We must be. We need to pray for each other, for our community, for our friends, for all those who will cross our path this week, for the ministries that we do in this church, and for the opportunity to do more. We need to pray for our church leaders locally and globally. And we need to speak as well as listen when we pray. Our mission, if we choose to accept it, is to make disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And to do that, we must be in regular conversation with Jesus so that we know that we are truly on the path of discipleship making that this church is intended to be. Not somebody else's church, this church. We have to learn and listen to how Jesus is leading us to grow in relationship with Christ through building and nurturing relationships with others. Do you hear the wording of that? Our church council believes as leaders that making disciples is first about making relationships. So, fellow travelers on this journey, I think we can very safely say that the ship of First United Methodist Church is healthy, is watertight, and it is ready to take on new workers, new crew members to make disciples for Jesus Christ, for the transformation of the world. May God guide us as we set sail in 2020. Amen. One of the ways that we can do mission and make disciples is through our financial gifts. And so I invite you to share what God has given you that we may continue our work here.
gracious God, we give you thanks for the many good gifts you bring into our lives each and every day. We ask that you accept these gifts to be used to make disciples for Jesus Christ here on earth. Amen. Our closing hymn is another Charles Wesley hymn, Oh, Four Thousand Tongues to Sing. For over 200 years, it has always been the first hymn in the Methodist hymnal. Now, Charles got a little bit carried away. There are actually 17 verses to this hymn. If you want to see them, you can look on page 58. Um, I like singing all 17 verses. However, I understand that not everybody likes to sing all 17 verses. So we're not going to sing all 17 verses. But we will join our voices to praise God. Go now in the peace and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, going out to do the work of making disciples by growing relationships. Amen.